Who speaks of art speaks of poetry. There is not art without a poetic aim. Artist Edward Vuillard. Dan McCall believes that art is a collaboration between the heart and the mind. The result of that often contentious, frustrating collaboration are paintings that expose the artist's soul. Dan's paintings are rich with thick texture, vibrant colors, and strong contrast. As a contemporary Impressionist painter, his works are highly sought out by collectors and people who love art. His paintings dance between the realms of representational, figurative, and abstract expressionism. Dan is always exploring, always experimenting. I first discovered Dan McCall about 20 years ago when I found his book, A Proven Strategy for Creating Great Art, on the shelf of a Borders bookstore. Of course, Borders is no longer. However, Dan's wisdom lives on in this rare and highly sought-after book. This wasn't just another how-to-paint book. Dan went beyond that. He explored such topics as opening your heart, rendering versus expression, developing a point of view, broadening your perceptions, enjoying your journey, and much more. In our conversation in this edition of The Artful Painter, Dan continues his exploration of things that affect an artist's growth. In a world where people are so quick to take sides and condemn those who do not agree with them, it certainly takes courage to create. Dan wants to help artists break out from the chains of oppressive, opinionated art-making dogma and learn to freely express themselves in their paintings. The challenge is much like that of a child who uses exuberant colors to paint a tree, but are crushingly chided for not painting the leaves of the tree the color green like you're supposed to. Dan McCaw is on a mission to help artists continue painting their purple trees. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Appreciate you being on The Artful Painter today. It's really my pleasure. I I always enjoy kind of expanding some of my thoughts and, you know, sharing them. My first exposure to you was I was in a Borders bookstore. You remember when those those still existed? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm in Borders and I stumble across this beautiful art book that you had written. And that was my first exposure to you. I bought it immediately. I mean, it just, it didn't take much to sell it. I, I just saw it, bought it. But I'll tell you what about, the, there's something about that book that hasn't been matched by anyone in the years that have passed. It's been some 20 something years, I suppose. But that book was more about how to be a painter rather than how to paint, even though that's covered. But there was you immediately went for the heart in that book. In fact, the opening chapter was opening the heart. That is what stood out to me about that book. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you for that. No, it was uh, I was like I said, um, maybe previously to you, I had to fight for. I, w- I didn't care for the title of that book, mm. and I have to uh, had to apologize for everybody that I met that said they had one. I fought with the publisher, but in the end, he uh, he convinced me and won me over about using it since he said he's he's done this a lot. But I thought it was a little egotistical. Well, what, and, would, well, what would the title have been if you had gotten your way? I think just a search for self. You know, I think that's what it's all about for all of us. I think there's different stages, just in, as in life, different stages of art where initially it's about developing a skill or uh, trying to, you know, paint a rose or a tree or a landscape or or a portrait. But I think as a young artist, and that's what I did. I went to school to actually to be a commercial artist because I really didn't know that you could make a living doing fine art. And I I came from a a fairly small mining town 
uh, Butte, Montana, which was 92% Irish Catholic. And and I did really, in high school, I didn't, there was no art classes or whatever. So it was kind of just my own interest in art. And my mother was an artist and I gravitated towards that as a, as a form, I think, of not knowing that, of kind of self-expression. I think everybody wants to be heard in some fashion, even if it's to themselves. And that's, uh, I was always attracted to, uh, to art and the facility that I saw and some people that could draw. And that was just very attractive to me. I remember being very young, I don't know how old it was, 10 or so. And I, and I was outside, we had taken a, a small road trip, a daily trip, and uh, we were in a small town in Montana, and I don't know if it was Ennis, Montana. It was a very small town, but outside a bar, there was a cowboy with his easel sitting on his bench painting. He was painting a landscape. And it was wow. it was like mag- magic to me. You know, I saw these trees appear, and I could just sit and watch that. Uh, and I still can. I can sit and watch people draw with the same amazement uh, that I had when I was a little kid. So those things, I guess, and just being just being encouraged to um, be creative, I think is is really important. I think we lose that. Well, as a young child, we look for somebody to be excited in what we're doing. As a young kid, everything seems to be experimenting and, and new and exciting. And uh, I think basically our, we look to our parents or whoever mainly probably our mothers. And if we see what we're doing, if we see excitement in her, we continue. If we don't, what do we do? We change what we're doing until we see some excitement. And that's, I think that happens all all through our life. I think as we grow and we go into school and, you know, we're, we are drawing our purple tree and the teacher's praising Mary or Johnny that's painting the tree trunk brown and leaves green. And all of a sudden, we start to then change in order to be validated, to fit in, to be accepted. And I think we do those. That's so true. We leave go of, of ourself uh, to fit in, whether it be society or, or uh, school or relationships, in order to be validated. And I think we give up a lot of things then that we had we taken. And, you know, sometimes we... We have to change through, you know, jobs or they're, they're just conditions that force us into change, make decisions that maybe we wouldn't have made have the circ- had the circumstances been somewhat different. But I, I do think that brings a lot of frustration to people that as they get older, there's a need to answer some of those things as a child that we gave up. And this is my own kind of philosophy. It may be just mine and other people have their own, but I do think that these voids in us, uh, if they can't be fulfilled by, you know, money and buying material things, then maybe they're fulfilled by alcohol or drugs. So there's that void. And I think some of it is just the frustrations that uh, a search of identity you mentioned the purple tree. I, I, when, as you were talking about that, it, it really welled up within me, the, uh, my troubles in school. You know, if I drew in class, you know, my hand got slapped by a ruler. Uh, it, it's almost like creativity got beat out of us <laughs> at some point. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, that's a different issue. Uh, but we, we are looking for, we are looking for some measure of approval when we paint. I think it's been everything. You know, I, I think we're constantly one to be validated. And I think that's a, a big issue with uh, why we are so fearful of change or trying something new. I think that that's fear is the biggest thing that holds us back. And mm. I think it's just different degrees of fear for each person. Some it's fear of humiliation or rejection or or failure. And even deeper than that, maybe fear of, of shame, you know, to 
be put down or humiliated is very shameful. So we avoid change because change with change, there's always uncertainty and with uncertainty brings in fear. And it's, I think, the biggest roadblock for creativity that we have. I think whenever we try to be perfect or meet the expectations of somebody else, that destroys creativity. I I think it's a a real, real hard thing to overcome. I think so, too. Uh, Even as, see, I started learning how to paint much later in life. But as I started to learn to paint, I I found myself struggling with that, um, balancing this conflict of painting what I wanted to paint versus how others, you know, might accept Mm -hmm. what I'm painting or not. No, I I understand that entirely. And I think that's how most people are. They, They look to be validated by somebody else instead of their own validation about themselves. And and that's a big, big thing to get over because we've been, in some sense, we're all conditioned to believe a certain type of art is what art is about, where other people are raised differently. And, you know, I was raised probably and attracted to, like a lot of people, towards traditional academic art. But as I get older, I leave go of that. As a young artist... I wanted to take a beautiful scene and depict it to render it to to whatever skill I had at that time. And the more that you do something, the better you get at it. But so I would take the the model or the landscape and bring it into me. As I got older, there was a transference of I, I want to take what's inside me and bring it out. So there's a difference there that this evolution of of an artist, at least, you know, and again, this is just my journey I'm explaining and my philosophy and my ideas, but creativity lays in uncertainty when the solution can be anything. And when you open that up to yourself, when when I don't, you know, representational art uh, is limited by perspective, by proportion and so on. Well, when we start to think kind of outside the box where we can distort or we can add a shape if we like a shape uh, because it just feels right, where that type of thinking, more expressionist painting, is based basically on intuition, feeling, and where the other is based on, again, the reality of perspective, proportion, and so on. So I, I find that it's much more liberating when I can express something inside me that is not I'm not contained or trapped by by these rules of of uh, perspective and and proportion and so on. So if I want to distort a figure, if I want to uh, take something out of perspective, if it feels right to me, again, when you're painting abstractly or more expressionistically. You have to trust your instincts, your intuition. That's that's the compass, and it doesn't have a, a a dial that says north. You you only know it when you, it feels right to you. Before you know it, because you're compared as the head in the right proportion to the body, is uh, and so on. But I find now that I'm there's a much more of a of a liberation when I can do anything when anything can be the solution. Well, that's one thing I've noticed. Um, all I had to measure, I suppose, in the beginning with your work is, of course, I mentioned the book, but um, which, you know, it's, it's, you can you can see the beginnings of, of that because you see the ambiguity in the faces. And and I've got to tell you, they're, they're some of the most beautiful um, grays I've ever seen in paintings. That's that's a that's a side point, but I just love the grays. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah. And, and the shadow, you know, a lot of artists will talk about, uh, you know, how they're interested in light, which I understand, but the shadows become a dominant part of even some of your earlier work. But then I see the evolution of it. You have th- that work has evolved over, over time. And, uh, I like it as much now as I did <laughs> then. I like seeing that that growth or those changes uh, that you've made in the type of art that you do, even the expression, the abstract, the, the purely abstract. 
uh, really stand out. Yeah, and I think that people shy away from things that they don't understand. They may feel it, and that's the important mm-hmm. thing. You know, it's, it's about feeling of the art. Not I still appreciate something very skillfully done, and you know, I went through those stages of of academic proportions, and and that's how I was schooled. I, I was schooled in that traditional way of looking at things, but I've moved more and more. It's like learning to drive a car. You know, the whole thing about driving a car isn't that you're constantly looking at the the gauges and keeping it right in the middle of the road. The, the whole reason for driving a car is to take you on your adventure. And it doesn't have to be contained within. You don't have to stay on the main road. And so it was liberating. At really... What helped me is my two sons are artists, and they're really become much more my teacher now. They come in with a different wow. point of view. They come in with um, this youth has a lot of courage and the and exuberance of youth, different. right? <laughs> oh yeah, there's yeah. an energy, and I just uh, I, I really do learn a lot from them because. Um, the book that you're talking about was 20 years ago, and exactly. it was more representational things. I've I've learned and moved uh, uh, moved in uh, different directions, mainly taking the car off the road, I guess, and and seeing seeing new adventures, things that I normally what I wouldn't have seen or taken a chance to look at. You know, do we do we do we only work within like the framework of our own language and uh, trying to just perfect it to perfect that dialogue, that thing that we're used to doing over and over? Or do we search to broaden our perceptions where, you know, curiosity may open new choices that, uh, and maybe there are unknown implications to that, but, and it's not to dismantle what we've already learned, but it's, it's to contribute to a richer language in which to communicate. For an artist, it's essential to be curious. It's one of the main things, to be curious, to be open-minded, to be vulnerable, to be able to allow yourself in order to grow, to, to fail, to fall on your face, to get up. And the more that you do that, the more that you will become less fearful of falling on your face. And much I go home frustrated 80% of the days just because I didn't press things far enough. Did I do this? Did I do it because I was lazy? Did I, you know, so it's, but, but I found my worst days are in my best paintings because once you degrade something enough where you're not trying to protect it, you'll take chances. You'll try anything to make the thing work, you know? And so those are my best days. Those are my best paintings because I was willing to do that. When that happens, is it moving you more into experimentation? Yeah, I, I think that you are, you definitely are experimenting because you're not afraid. You're not afraid to, mm-hmm. that you might lose something that you cherish in the painting and you, you then sacrifice the whole painting in order for that one thing that you you want to hold on to because it helps to say that you're an artist. Otherwise, you leave at the end of the day. You, you think I'm no artist. I'm, you know, <laughs> if if the painting is bad, you can uh, nothing goes right for you. You're a bad person. If you do a good painting, you can wreck your car on the way home, and it doesn't matter. You still had a good day, but uh, still had an adventure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the adventure. Yeah, and you may have to hitchhike coming home, but you're still on the road. <laughs> Yeah, and you're you're still moving forward, but I think it is an adventure that it has to be exciting to you when you're painting. You have to uncover new things that you think, wow, if I didn't look here, you know, if I didn't take this chance, I would have never found this. So in a bad painting, I know there's a solution in there, or a painting that, let's say, I don't, at a certain point, I'm not, I don't like it. There's something wrong with it, but I don't know what it is. Now I don't, I used to be, oh yeah, the head's too big, the head's too small, this or that, but now it's about what moves me inside. Why do I not like this? What do I have to do to change? Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I'll put that painting aside 
and the next maybe three paintings that I do, I'll find a solution in those, and then I can pull the other one out. Sometimes I'm more aggressive when I come in the studio. Sometimes I'm insecure. I mean, I have all the same feelings that I did as a young painter. The only thing I know now is with persistence, I can overcome some of these things. I can, if I dig hard enough, you know, the Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet, said, if you hold your, <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing, if you hold your hand in the flame long enough, the flower will blossom. And I really believe that. You have to, I have to fight for every, for the life of every painting I do. And I, I know that if I sand it, scrape it, I keep, just changing it, changing it till something moves me inside. And if it doesn't, you know, again, I'm not relying on anything but instinct and intuition now. You know, my whole thing aesthetically to hold a painting together is value and design. I think that's, for me, that's what I'm attracted to. And my paintings are more set up graphically than they are you know, form and folds and things like that. They, that kind of, I, I'm not interested so much in that. And I think each painter has to do whatever type of painting or style of painting that makes them feel like an artist. So some have to paint from directly from a model. Some have to do everything photographically. Some have to paint abstractly. I, I think it's whatever... Neither of those are wrong. I think it's just a matter of what makes you feel like an artist. And you have to be able, no matter what direction you take, you have to be able to have enough uh, persistence to stay with it till you start to get something back from it. That's, that's holding your hand in the flame till a flower blossoms. To give it a chance if this is really what you want. A lot of people, you know, are just skill oriented. They want to paint a rose or like I say, a landscape. But there's much more out there. There's much more than you, you don't have to drive a learn to drive a, a car as as well as a race car driver to get you on the road. So to try to be curious, open minded, to look at things you normally wouldn't look at, to see what excites you. What is it that excites you in one painting that doesn't in another at a certain time certain things you're attracted to certain things you discard but that changes with experience with experience you gain knowledge and with knowledge you gain wisdom and with wisdom you're then better able to pick things of value when they pass before you and so it's, it's an evolution art is an evolution it's it's something within each of us that that passion is about being willing to hold your hand in that flame long enough to get something out of it. And that's that has to be that desire. Sometimes think we're an artist first, but we don't know how to express it <laughs> or we don't have the tools to express it. So I like your analogy of, of learning how to drive a car. You, you do have to have some fundamentals to be able to accomplish whatever it is that you want to express. It may be a different type of skill. Some skills may be, I guess, more weighted than others, but you still have to have some fundamentals to do that. And I think that's probably where some of the early frustration comes in. It's just, uh I don't know how to do that. I got this image in my mind and I don't know how to get it out. No, I absolutely agree that I think what it is, is that with any change, with anything new, you have to accept also that you're going to have challenges and with challenges, you're going to fall on your face. It's like a gymnast trying to do a somersault to begin with. 
you know, it's very hard to do the somersault till you practice, practice, practice. And if you have a if you have a goal in mind, you know, otherwise you're practicing, you're you're failing more than you're you're succeeding at anything. So if you don't have a positive objective in mind, you just are you're getting better at failing. I don't want to be an expert in that. <laughs> Yeah, but driving a car, you learn to drive the car uh, as you're driving it. So get it out on the road. Try, you know, the best thing to do with uh, in painting is just keep painting, keep painting, and back up. Uh, ask yourself good questions. You know, it isn't why am I such a bad painter? Because you'll see why. Uh, your brain will tell you why you're a bad painter. But if you say, what's good about this? What, what do I need? That what's it lacking? What? So if you ask yourself good questions, you'll get good answers. And uh, I think it's uh, it's just the fear of failure again. You know that this really, when you get into painting, it just supports that you're not a painter. You know, and that's untrue. I think everybody is unique, and I think everybody's creative. It's just that you have to have enough. You have to have enough persistence, and that's what passion is. Again, it's just that ability to withstand all the things that are going to be thrown at you whenever there's change. And if you can see little increments of success, then I, I, that'll push you on. You have to hang on to those things. But I'm always frustrated. I mean, I'm always this is, is this thing I'm doing. Am I really pressing myself? Am I really searching? Am I really am I lacking this? Do I am I a, am I a phony? Is it? I mean, it's, I'm the same as the the person that's just starting painting, but that makes it exciting because you know what's around. If I get if I do something over and over and over again. And I get better at it. It, it. You get. You have to realize when is your groove become your rut, and I think it's the searching and and being curious to go out and you say, God, why didn't I see that? Why didn't I? Uh, you know, I go out to a museum or I see other people's art, and I think, oh, why why didn't I see that thing this way? And I, we're all geared to certain sensitivities and. And that's what makes art beautiful. It's not that it's all the same. It's that the the beauty's in the uh, in the differences. And I, yes. I think that's that's important. That that is so true. That's why I never tire of art magazines and books and museum visits. You you get something from so many different people, so many different ways that it's expressed. It's just it's just beautiful to me that there's so many different ways. Otherwise, I'd only do one interview for this podcast, and that'd be that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, if there was one reality, you know, if there was one truth, then everybody would uh, would have that and and go on their way. But it's, I, I think, uh, you know, you know, each person's reality is their perception of that reality. You could be exhilarated flying in an airplane. I could be terrified. The reality is the same. It's just our perception is, is different. So if we broaden our perceptions, that some people look at our, a rainy day as cold, dreary, gloomy, depressing. Other people look at a rainy day as fresh smells, reflections, and so on. So it's if we broaden our perceptions, then you're able to pick things more positively that that maybe are truer to your nature. And that's what art is doing. We look at a situation. What can we take from here that's positive? What can we take from this situation that it's, will encourage us to, to push on? And... Um, you know, it's, it, creativity does not grow in the absence of thought. Uh, it's awakened when we ask questions, and the better the questions, the better answers. So we're we're always questioning ourselves. You know. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought about asking questions. Is I think sometimes we don't know what questions to ask. So, what would be the type of questions that we would ask ourselves? I think the ones that are I mean, the more positive ones. Like instead of what's bad about this painting, you know what what do I like about it? What doesn't it have that I see in somebody else's work? What how can I change it? What and that your brain's gonna you know the questions that you ask 
you may think you forgot about them, but your brain is working all the time. It's trying to figure out these things. You know, if it usually we usually when we think of self thought, it's ne- usually eighty percent of it's negative thought. You know, it's why am I such a bad person? Well, it'll tell you why. Because you you broke a window when you were this kid. You failed at this uh, test. You did. But if you ask, uh, you know, what's good about today or what's good about me or what's good about this pain? Well, it's good because I can change it. I can try things. I can, I can, um, uh, you know, make a bold stroke into this thing and then react to it. I think that's why sketchbooks are so good. You write down your thoughts, what you want out of something or what it inspired you or how you're feeling. And they're kind of private little things that nobody has to see your your frustrations your fears your whatever it might be but we also need time to literally do something without the fear of judgment on uh, on ourselves i mean mainly that's a thing we have to we have to stretch the boundaries of these we have to stretch the self-imposed boundaries that we place upon ourselves and i think that the more we do this, the more comfortable we get. You know, anything that's unfamiliar just it brings in fear. But the more we do it, the less fear it is. So knowledge dissipates fear. Certainly there are things to be fearful of. I mean, that's our survival system. But we, unfortunately, we place fear on a lot of things that don't necessarily need that fear. And it's the more experience that we gain, it's something more confidence. The more confidence we get, again, the, the better we're able to have, or the, have this. So the questions I would ask are positive questions. Why Why is it so such a good day here that I'm painting this terrible painting? I think <laughs> instead of, you know, the thing is I can change it. Okay, I don't know quite what to do, but I'm going to change something else, and I react to that. I paint maybe 10 paintings in one painting. I look at it, I back up, uh, and then I start to convince myself, oh, yeah, it's okay, yeah. Then I come back from lunch or a telephone call, and oh, my God, I hate this piece. So I'll scrape it, but the persistence, I know there's something in there. I know that there. if I keep digging, I'll find it. And I, I I just keep working it. I just keep, sometimes I have to let the paint dry, then I'll sand on it, then I'll scrape it, then I'll paint back into it. Most of the time that I find in painting, it's not more, it's not what, what more do I put into this painting? It's what do I take out? It, it becomes an archaeological dig sometimes, right? When you're sanding and scraping bed, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and you can see as you uncover the painting, there's <clears throat> some things are left from the last painting that are in there that add to this this richness or this patina of this this particular piece. It's a battle, you know. You you wage a you wage a battle. I do anyway within every painting. When I see painters that just start and it's clean, the surfaces, <laughs> I, I somewhat envy that. But uh, I'm I'm at my paintings now. Because I have to trust instinct, intuition, and feeling. I don't know when they're going to be done. I'm, a, I'm basically a passenger on a ship without a rudder. I don't know its destination or its time of arrival, but I just go with it. And when it comes out, you know, if it sits around here for a while, like somebody that hangs out at a barber shop long enough, they'll get a haircut. So if it sits around here and uh, in six months, I'll probably pull it back in and change it because I've hopefully moved on. My perspective is different. My, I look at things differently. And that's the beauty of of an artist. You put something up, and again, uh, you look at a painting and you say, this is a terrible, this is a terrible painting. That's the best groundwork, the battlefield for you to enter it again, because you're not afraid to take chances. You're not afraid to experiment. You're not afraid to throw something at it and react to it. And if that doesn't work, then same thing. You just set it aside till, you know, sometimes the surface has to dry. Sometimes you just set it aside and then you look over when it's leaning against the wall and you go over and pick it up again and, and start it again. But I just keep at it. I mean, do you ever throw one away? 
No, because they're waiting there for me to, they say you've taken me this far, you know, and you're, if I throw it away, then I, I discarded something that I can jump off at that point. I don't have to fear anything about it. It's already, uh, it's already to a point where there's nothing in there that uh, that's sacred to me. I can take chances in it. Some things I'll leave maybe. Sometimes I'll just eliminate a lot of areas around it and leave a certain 10% of that painting. But no, I don't, I don't throw anything away. I, I have a 5,000 square foot studio <clears throat> and my two sons are, um, are in here with me, but we've got paintings. I mean, it's ridiculous. They're everywhere, <laughs> but they're, they're like handicapped kids are waiting to be helped. You know, they're, uh, so no, they, yeah. they and some things that I thought were really bad. Now a year from now, I look back and say, well, gee, there's some value in that. So no, I think everybody just has to be encouraged. You know, creativity just sometimes takes a breath of encouragement under its wings to lift it. And a lot of people sit at home just negatively criticizing themselves over and over again about how bad their painting is. And uh, instead of, I know inside each person, I taught at the Art Center College Design for you know, 16 years, I think it was, sometimes part-time. What What did you teach? I taught head painting, which I hardly put a face in a uh, painting anymore. And I taught all different parts of illustration and and uh, some figurative things. And it was all academic. And I, I was also went there for this is a kind of a funny story. I when I first came wanting to go to an art school, the, the art school that was most predominant for me to go to, it stood out that it was one of the best was the Art Center College of Design in Los Angeles. And so I put together my little drawings and a portfolio and and sent it off to them and they got rejected, you know, the stuff got rejected. So I ended up going to uh, the San Francisco Academy of Art and I spent, I think, two years there and, and then... Uh, I was given a scholarship there. I, I ran out of money. I had I had two kids at the time. I and just I didn't have any money. I, I worked as an iron worker putting up buildings and structures in the summer because my my father was uh was the superintendent in the iron workers union, so he got me in there. But uh then I would save enough money and go to school but uh, I'll tell you a funny story if I'm relating to this. But anyway, after I went to uh, art school for, I think it was two, two and a half years there, I came to Los Angeles, got a, a job as an illustrator for a design studio. And I'd go to school at night uh, at the Art Center College of Design. And I would uh, I befriended a couple instructors, so... I didn't have a lot of money with the kids, and I think at this time now I had three kids, and I was, they allowed me to sneak into classes, so I, I think I went 12 oh, terms. that's good. The yeah. art and then the Art Center of College Design, I became, asked me to be on the faculty there. <laughs> so I <laughs> Well, you put I yourself out there. there. You made yourself available. I finally got, yeah, I finally got in there, but. Going back to my experience in San Francisco, yeah. which is a little side story, since I didn't have any money in San Francisco, if anybody knows that city, I mean, it, parking is horrendous. So I would park on a side street and uh, they had meters and you could only, you know, when the meter ran out, if they were lucky enough to get your car before you get a ticket. but. So I I would run out when the model would break. I run out and uh, on the side streets. I guess there was no, there were were no parking meters, but they would mark your tire, if I can remember right. So they'd chalk your tire. I'd go out and race the chalk off, so I wouldn't get a ticket. Over that period of three months, I got, I was uh, getting tickets, 
And so one day, over the loudspeaker, it said, Dan McCall, come to the office. So I went down to the office, and there was a guy in a suit there. And uh, I thought, no, well, maybe somebody's off from a job or something. And so, uh, so, so he said, Dan McCall, and I said, yeah. And he pulled out a badge and said, I have 91 warrants for your arrest. <laughs> so they, they arrested me and threw me in jail. I, I didn't have a phone. My wife didn't know where I was at. They threw me in the city jail, and then they threw me into the county jail. I went to court. I had called a friend of mine, and he went out to, we lived out in Pacifica because it was cheap, but it was tremendously foggy. That's why I guess it was so cheap. Anyway, <clears throat> she had come in. I think they arrested me on a Friday, and then I went to court on Monday, and then they sentenced me to five days, I think it was, in this county jail. <laughs> I mean, it was a, it was an experience. I could I could write a thing on that. But anyway, my wife didn't know where I was, so my friend, by the time she got to the county jail, I'd already been sent to, or to the city jail. I'd already been <laughs> sent to the county jail, so... And um, all this time, my car is still parked. They're getting more tickets, so it, it was a it was a real fiasco. I think I went to court like three times uh, and jailed twice, and trying to get get these tickets all taken care of. So <laughs> that was a little sideline of uh, of the experience of San Francisco. I, I did not know that you had a a life of crime behind you there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had to park my car after that down underneath the freeway and walk, uh, walk to the school. So that was, uh, so erasing was, the chalk didn't work, huh? <laughs> not 90 times it did. <laughs> so I figured my, I came from Montana. So my car was out of state. I figured, you know, they're just, I just throw away the tickets and, uh, and let it be that. I, mean, I would erase it when I could, but uh, I guess I got too cavalier about it being out of town, out of state. So uh, that was my some of, some of my experience in San Francisco. And it was it was uh, it was an adventure. Well, and that's it. We build we build a, a series of life experiences that inform what we do today. Do we not? Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're correct, and I think the impact of our youth is is tremendously important on you know the decisions and how we look at things in the future. So it's you know we're all carrying around all these hopes, dreams, fears, frustrations, life experiences, and then I guess they all have a degree of. Uh, they affect the that brush stroke we put on the canvas and uh, our decisions of what how to put that stroke on i guess so malleable if we allow it to be allow it to be molded and and allow ourselves to to shape it uh, one of my biggest fears of getting older was you know the stereotype as we get older we we get set in our ways and that's the last thing in the world i want to be is set in my ways i want to be willing uh, to change now how am i succeeding at that well that's debatable but <laughs> but i i want to be open <laughs> To, to technology yeah. <laughs> and tools and art and expression and opinions. I, I want to have the right to change my opinion, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. It's about, the, our journey is about learning something new, about being curious, open-minded, mm -hmm. learning to temper our frustration and fears with action. You know, and it's, as long as you have those things, as long as you're curious and open-minded and searching and and try to, with experience, shed some of that, these fears, or at least put them in the right 
proportion in the right place, then you're not going to become rigid. You, you know, as we become older, we do think of cynical and and being rigid and stiff like our bodies. But if we if we're flexible, if we keep moving as we get older, then I think then we we don't ever ever lose. I'm more curious now than I've ever been. I'm more excited about taking chances. I know that if I fall on my face, I can get up. I know that if I dig hard enough in a painting, there'll be a solution. What drives me is the thing that you have to have for creativity is frustration. It's the driving force of creativity. I don't like this enough to change it. You know, it's until the fear of never changing outweighs the fear of failure, we won't move forward. And it's it's that's important. I think that we we always are open minded. We're always curious. We look at new things. We see how can we adapt. How can we use that? You know, it isn't. When I go out and look at galleries or museums or other people's artwork, it isn't whether I. The important thing isn't whether I like it or not. It's that it starts a conversation within me. Then I start to question myself. I start to say what. What do I? What could I use out of this? What is my piece like? And why is my piece? Why if I don't like this piece so much that I'm looking at? It has a lot of similar things in my work, so I look at my work a little hard. It just starts a conversation. And if you're asked, uh, you know, like I've said probably to you before, creativity is like telling I tell you a joke. And that reminds you of something, and you tell yes. me one back, and that reminds me of another joke. And that's how creativity works. We start to think. We start to use our imagination. We start to um, to use the, the our whole um, facilities that we have to explore explore with, what's within us. I think we all have everything we need. <clears throat> it's just we suppressed it. We denied it. We're embarrassed about it we're, but I think the art allows us a way of searching for those things that are buried within us and I think we do like I said to you with the purple tree I think we do bury things within us that are so personal that if we're afraid to expose them because if they're if they're not accepted it, it it's so central to our being that it crushes us and so I think that's why people are afraid so afraid of change Art is so central to our being, you know, it isn't like, let's say, being an accountant where two and two is always four, uh, you know, for so they can go home and leave their numbers there. This is with us all the time. If we do a bad painting, we're a bad person almost, you know, it's, I, I think it's hard for us to expose that. Like I said, to take something that's dear to us and expose it and then it's crushing to have somebody say, I hate you or I hate this or you're in, you know, whatever, you're a terrible painter. And um, we we hang on the negative things much more than the positive. You know, a hundred people can say, I love your painting, I love this, but one person can say, this painting's the worst painting I've ever seen. That's crushing. And that's all you think about, right? That's all you think about. Yeah. And what do you do then? You change it so that person doesn't feel that way about you. Mm. And that's what we do our whole lives when we're, uh, we need, we need that free space where we don't have those things compound because enough of those things, you know, if we, if you take, if you take uh, your life like a movie and out of that movie, the frames that you take are only the negative frames and you piece those things together and all of a sudden you have an, a movie that you think about yourself that is all just negative things. That's a horror movie. It's a horror movie and it's one that you've created for yourself. And so, but we're so, we're so attuned to what other people think about us, judge us because we're not so secure and how we feel about ourselves, about our art, about about who we even are. And art is just an extension of ourselves already. The things that ruin a piece of art are the same things that re ruin ourselves as, in, as a person or relationship or whatever. And I think that um, I think it's hard for people 
to really expose who they are. You have to do that. You usually do it in a safe environment. People that you know, you show to your friends or or if you even do that. But but I, I do think that um, it's hard to do those things. And uh, yet we we want we don't want to change to meet that other person's expectations of us. But we it doesn't matter. It can be the juiciest, shiniest red apple there ever was. Some people don't like apples. You know, it's just the way it is. And we have to be able to accept that, that we don't have to please everybody. That somebody else shouldn't dictate to us whether we like this particular taste of fruit or, or we like, if we should like liver because they like it. I think what makes art beautiful is that it's different, that each person has this uniqueness. And not everybody's going to be attracted to it, but at least they might be moved one way or the other. I I think it's better to have somebody hate your art than not to even to just be... Just be hidden. Yeah, just be... Yeah, you know, at least to have a decision about it because... That intensity that person hates, there's going to be other people on the other side that I find the art that's more controversial. I have more passionate people that like it and maybe more passionate people that dislike it. But there's a there's a dynamics there. You know, art, life or and painting. When I say they're kind of the same, if you think of painting. What determines kind of the dynamics of a painting is the use of contrast that you use. White to black is very contrasty, red to green. Nothing of one is contained in the other. So when we look at life, why is the good girl attracted to the bad guy? Because there's a tremendous amount of dynamics there. But there's also, when you do paint that way and in life, what happens is in painting, in order to harmonize stuff, unless you want that dynamics, and maybe it's a proportion of that dynamics you have in a painting. But what happens is we try to add a little of the red to the green and a little of the green to the red. So that starts to harmonize because now each contains a little of the other. In relationships, what happens a lot of times is that we keep adding more and more of one to the other, and pretty soon they're so similar, there's no dynamics in it. So in painting, you still want to keep the identity of the red and the identity of the green, yet they're harmonious because each contains a certain amount of the other without destroying that color of the other. So there's a there's a dynamics there. It's all about, in painting, everything is relative to what you put next to it. If you want a straight line, you put something crooked next to it. If you want a rich color, you put something gray next to it. Um, and all of that, you know, painting is subjective. So, And that's what makes it beautiful is everybody, you, you know, if you know some of the basics of things, and you, you just have to know a little about a car to know how to drive it, but you'll learn by driving. And I think same way with painting. You you study some of these basic principles, and they're they're not a they're not a whole lot of them. It's like going to a gym, and and the, the instructor there says, "This is the exercise to build your legs." Now, if you want to do enough of those to build your legs, that's one thing. You know the principle of it, but how much effort do you want to put into? How much experimentation? How much? Um, same with with the basics, the fundamentals of design, of color, of those things. I'm I'm thinking of doing like a free online class. So I, I know art schools now are so expensive and, you know, there's a lot of really good instruction out there, I, I think, on videos and that. But this would be something free. I, You know, I had great instructors and I had I know a lot of great artists and great friends that have shared a lot of things with me for nothing. I mean, I went, like I said, to art school at the art center for nothing. Uh, I think giving back some of these things for little rural areas where the little kid has, or the little, you know, whatever, the lady, the the older lady has. Yeah, uh, I was going to say even the old guy. (laughs) No, I I mean, everybody has a has a chance to to kind of renew something in them that's yeah. there. It just hasn't been it hasn't been brought out. And I think all these things lay all these treasures that everybody has lays within them 
It's just that somebody has to validate them. If you take a little child and he brings down a drawing or, or she brings down a drawing of a cat, and you praise that drawing of the cat, what do they do? They'll run up to their room and grab every cat painting they've ever done, and then they'll grab paper and start drawing cats. Yes. And it's just that, that breath of encouragement. And we need that all through our lives. We need those little sparks of encouragement that pull us through the frustration of the day, of the painting, of the, who we are, of the negative things we feel about ourselves, the, the positive things that, that other people can say about us. Or we need all those things um, to move us forward. And Well, sign me up, Dan. Yeah. Sign me up. Well, I, I, I just, I'm trying to figure out how to do it, uh, how to pull it off and how to video it. And I get involved with it. Now I'm trying to see, I, I'm gotten involved now with looking at a lot of cinematographers and master classes in photography to see how to pull this thing off. So it's, so it's exciting to, to, you know, it just doesn't become boring. I, Sometimes, uh, even though I can sit and watch somebody draw for a while, when I used to even watch demonstrations and it was three hours and watch somebody, I got I got bored a lot too, you know, just watching somebody with a little tiny brush doing an eye or something. And, uh, so I want to, if I do this, I want to be able to take the experience I've had as a teacher and bring it uh, to to people for nothing, you know, just get it out there, but it takes some time and, and to put it together and those type of things. So I, I, I'm great at procrastination. I've got a lot of ideas of things of putting together a documentary. It, what you're talking about is something that uh, I did a live stream yesterday with a filmmaker in England. Uh, his name is Joe Hawkins. He does all the videos for rosemary and co brushes and you know oh, yeah, we, yeah. We, we had this very conversation and i had a um i had a, a i had a person send me an email late last night and it was in response to an interview that i did with bill anton uh, artist bill anton bill doesn't want to be a teacher you know he don't want to teach people how to paint he doesn't feel like he's qualified for that though though he's for the genre and the style that he does, he's, he's one of the best. And, and so yeah. this, this reader wrote in, he says, you know, he would be, he, he doesn't think he would be a good teacher for how to paint workshop. However, it sounds to me like he would be an excellent teacher for a, how to be a painter workshop. And I thought, mm -hmm. that's it. That's exactly yeah. it. I don't know how many tutorials I can stand to what of how to mix a color but how to be a painter, how to make this work, <laughs> uh, like you're yeah. talking about expressing yourself. Oh, this is, this, this is music to my ears. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know it's, uh, it's, it's something that everybody has to deal with. You know, it, every artist, uh, these barriers that we put up before us, I, most people say I can never draw a straight line. Well, I can't either. I think creativity self-expression to want to be noticed and heard and validated is within all of us and art, the performing arts, all, you know, whether it be poetry or writing or filming or photography or, or dance or whatever it might be are all these ways of expressing ourselves. And I think that it's really important probably as much as, as an arithmetic <laughs> that's taught in school to learn yes. this, this type of freedom. And that's what it's about, is to free yourself from judgment. An intimate conversation, when the artist frees himself from the judgment and the restraints and the opinions of others and allows himself a vantage point where, you know, like intuition and instinct and feeling becomes the guide and everybody has that within them they just don't trust it in the same way when they look at abstract art if they can't define what it is or, or can't find a story within it then they they reject it instead of does it move me you don't have to define everything everything doesn't have to have a a story to it or it just has to move you and 
that's the subconscious. When I paint abstractly, it's purely subconscious. I'm judging things, shapes, colors. What moves me? What? What? Why does this one shape work for me and not another? And it's different for everybody. And I think to allow yourself those freedoms is really, really important. And well, I think that's something that's evident in your paintings is that uh, a lot of times the subject is subjugated. You know, it, it it recedes into the background. And what becomes dominant are the contrast and the textures. I love the physicality of paint, textures of paint. It's almost like you're doing a 3D sculpture on a 2D surface. Yeah, I feel that way too. And I, I, I've always liked kind of sculpture that's unfinished, that, I, that the sculpture hasn't freed the figure from the, the stone or the clay. Or, I, I like that I can push paint around. And, you know, when you're doing very thin washes, just a little something will destroy that, that uh, wash or whatever, where I've got paint on there. I can throw other paint into it. I can scrape it. I can, you know, so I, I do like that, too. It's just the, the tactile relationship between me and the paint. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a, a battlefield where, where I'm not uh, destroyed by just a tiny little thing. It takes a lot to, to move something in a uh, opposite direction, I guess. Would you be willing just to talk a little bit? I don't want to dwell on it too much, but just the, the, the tools of the trade. What do you like to paint on? What do you paint with? No, I, I agree. I love to see, you know, the easel I made was out of two by fours. and You made and your own? I made my own easel just out of, because it's big. It's a big block that can be moved around. There's an easel on both sides. But it isn't a traditional three-legged easel or even an easel like what are the Hughes easels. It's it's this massive kind of thing that I have to lift up and down. And so I've made it out of two by fours and and, uh, it's a box type of thing where I store paintings inside of it, but I can push it as wheels on it. I don't know if I've explained it very well, but I use, uh, I use, Oil predominantly. I use Gamblin oil paint, and I use uh, white in the big cans. Sometimes I feel the white is a little loose, so I'll mix. Uh, and I use titanium white. Um, I'll mix some whiting that framers use to gesso uh, frames before they leaf it. I'll put that in there to thicken it a little bit. What's it called? What's it? I missed. I missed what it It's a whiting. I, I'm not sure. John, my eldest son, uses it. He's doing a frame. And I mix that into the white, and it'll thicken it up so I can get it kind of thick. And I, I'm not sure to what degree I should be using it because I don't know how it breaks down the oil. But I get it so it's just thicker than... Daniel Smith used to make a good white, a mixed uh, kind of thick white, and they discontinued it. And uh, so I had to try to, you know, compensate for that. You know, I used to lay all my paints out. and I used to scrape my palette. Now I'm lazy. My brushes are, they're <laughs> nothing. They're, they're really, I go down and sometimes I buy brushes at, uh, there's a, um, Michael's, uh, I think it's more of a uh, craft store. Big flat brushes, you get like four of them for $5. I'll use those. And I, I use some of the other, I used to really like the Filberts that were Edgar de Gaulle, Fil- Filbert brushes. I still have some of those that I use. You know, some of the paintings, I'll try different things. I'll put them on with whatever's out there, a spatula or something. You know, I, I generally, a lot of times I'll use a palette knife and I'll, 
because I like how it lays it in without the brush strokes. Then I'll come over with a softer brush and knock out the the look of the palette knife. And sometimes then I'll come into that over that with I'll dip into the flat brush and and some medium and turpentine and I'll just go right over that so it kind of just melts it. Now I'll just try anything, you know. I you first try the, the things that you've always used. I paint on masonite, gessoed masonite, a lot on the smaller pieces. Then on the canvases, I use cotton canvas. I take stretcher bars, make the size of stretcher bar I want. Then I put a piece of luon over it and tack it down onto the stretcher bars. Then I'll uh, shellac the luon so the acid doesn't come through on the canvas. Then I'll stretch the canvas over it because then I can become real aggressive. I can sand on it. I can. So you won't have the bounce. I don't have that bounce or that. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I can be really aggressive with the, uh, with how I paint and like I say, scrape it. Sometimes it's dry. I'll sand it with a sander. Basically, you know, I'll try anything. It's like a ship sinking, you know. First, you'll <laughs> look for the lifeboats, and if they're not there, then you'll look for the life jackets, and if they're not there, pretty soon you'll see if a shoe will float. So I try anything. Take you know, the heel of the shoe and make a mark. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, it's just, it just depends on how how well the painting's going. But, I'll, you know, sometimes I'll tint the gesso. So, so that when I put a white on, it stands out as white. I, it doesn't, I really don't have any secrets other than, you know, I probably just apply paint pretty thick. I don't, a lot of times I won't mix, I won't mix a particular color. I'll grab three or four colors and put it on at once. Are you still working with a limited palette? Yeah, I I work with kind of, none of my paint laying on my palette uh, none of the tubes have caps on so I just grab whatever laying out there I'm kind of lazy about it. I used to wash my brushes I'm so know, glad uh, to hear this you know you're validating my existence <laughs> and my studio I practices <laughs> yeah I I, uh, I tell this I used to tell the students you know cleanliness is next to godliness but <laughs> I'm the worst I, I don't uh, I, I walk away from my the paint still on the palette other people you know take and and uh, clean their palette every uh, I really I really don't do much of that I, I need I guess I'm waiting for a, an assistant to do some of those things and they just never show up do they they never show up so the next day I have to Go ahead and uh, yeah. So what unopened? I mean, what open tubes of paint do you have laying out on your palette? Well, I use I like black a lot. I mean, I just like it, and I use uh, black and white. Well, my paintings again. I I used to paint with a lot more color. I kind of limited. I have I have the yellows. You know, I have a as long as you have a warm and a cool of each of the primaries. Uh, you know, if you have a quinacridone red, I use with with a, a cadmium red light. I use an ultramarine blue and a phthalo blue. I use, a, I have, sometimes I lay out a phthalo green or permanent green just to add something into there. And my yellows, I use Indian yellow. I have cad yellow light, uh, uh, kind of a lemon yellow, I guess, and I and I cadmium orange, and you pretty much, if you investigate those things, you can you can uh, get just about everything you need. Sometimes I'll throw in a burnt sienna, or just just to you know, it, it's right there instead of trying to mix it. I guess. Well, uh, isn't it amazing that it's just like a like a guitar has six strings, and yet all the thousands upon thousands of, of songs that have been written just with a guitar, right? With six strings. Yeah. So yeah. You, uh, yeah. It's amazing what we can express with just those uh, six, seven, eight tubes of uh, a paint. Yeah. And I, I think it's just finding something that you want to express, you know, representational painters. Are, this is just my kind of analogy of a quick analogy. 
you know, there's representational painters look at the object, find the beautiful landscape, find the beautiful model, set them up in a situation, and paint them. So the object is kind of the main thing. The object is the what they're, you know, they become kind of, and I guess this is in an academic sense. When I look at some of the contemporary artists, the object is not, let's say we have a chair and they, the representational artist says, oh, that's a beautiful chair. I like the color, the textures. I'm going to paint that. So they paint it. The difference is when you start to become critical thinkers, and I see a lot of that becomes the dominant thing in more contemporary art, is uh, it, the chair is only a symbol to represent something they're trying to say. So what if I said they're, I, I'm using the same chair, but let's just say they come around to the chair by saying, you know, I want to say loneliness, or I want to say waiting. What are the symbols I could use for that? So the, the the thought, the idea is there first, and then the object comes in, then the symbol comes into the play. And that's kind of where I see my interpretation when I think of more critical thinking about something. And I think that's a integral part of, of uh, if you can come with your thought, what is it that I want to say? What is the best, symbols I can use, what are the, the difference between literature and poetry, literature kind of spells out everything for you in some sense when I take it to to that, that direction. Poetry is more elusive. Yes. Yeah. So I started off talking about a 20-year-old book, which is people people are still buying this thing if they can find it. I was just looking on my own affiliate links, uh, you know, four copies have sold for an average of $120 a piece. So people are wanting this thing and it's, it's 20 years old, but is there a follow-up? Is there a new book in you, uh, you know, that's coming out? Again, yeah. I, I wanted to do a revise of that book and I still should do that. I, I have hundreds and hundreds of notes on, you know, it goes on right on down, uh, talking more in depth about curiosity, about fear, about um, about the the maybe the internal things an artist goes through. Um, and I've written a ton of stuff, and I I was wanting to come out f- with that book, and then I wanted to come out. Maybe I should incorporate it into a tabletop book, and then I should. Maybe just expound on the instructional book. So I have all these things in mind. Do I want to do that video? Do I want to, you know, so I'm just, I I just get overwhelmed by it. But I would like to do that because um, I get calls all the time too. Do you have an extra one or, but I don't. So (laughs) it went through three printings and then uh, it's just, it's just gone, but I've had other, I had a company call me want to republish it, but I, I want to revise it because I think I have more things to say about about it. You know, twenty years of experience and yes. hopefully some wisdom with that uh, will add to it. Well, Dan, it's I'm glad I got to know you in the beginning that way through your first book. I'm sure that whatever you come out with will be just as or even more inspirational just having this conversation with you has just added a whole new dimension and chapter to my understanding of uh, of you and and your work and i'm deeply grateful for you for being uh, willing to take a few moments to talk with me here on the artful painter well i i appreciate you even asking me and uh i uh, i just hope all the artists out there listening uh, uh get something out of this just just the incentive to to take a chance to risk something Uh, it's not that hard to get up again it's amazing how things work out sometimes when I bought Dan McCall's book about 20 years ago I never dreamed I'd have this opportunity to actually talk with him. And what a delight it was to do that. 
and I definitely look forward to seeing the new videos he plans to produce and hopefully even a follow-up book uh, to the one that he published some 20 years ago. And you know what? I think a good working title for it, and it's not for me to set the title, that's that's his job. <laughs> but, but I can't help but think I would snatch that book up in a heartbeat if it was titled Painting Purple Trees. I just love that expression. If you can find a copy of his old book, it's worth getting. It, uh, it does remain my favorite art-making book in my library. Unfortunately, the prices are going way up on the used market for it. Uh, on Amazon, what I've seen is about the average is around $125 to $150. I just saw an eBay auction for it. Uh, it's still in the running the last time I looked. And it started off at $80, which would have been, I think in this particular case, a good buy. But the bidding has already taken it up to well over $120. So, you know, people like this book. It's a good book. It's worth getting. You can find out more about Dan McCall and his two sons, John and Danny McCall, by visiting their website at McCallContemporary.com. I'd like to take a moment to share some of the feedback that I have received regarding The Artful Painter. The first one comes from Scott Thompson. Uh, his subject is a uh, new listener. <laughs> hey, Carl, I found your podcast via Bill Anton's website. I really enjoyed your chat with him. I've known him for a while. Good man. Looking forward to listening to other casts as well as following you on Instagram. Best wishes, Scott Thompson. Hey, Scott, thank you. I'm, I'm really glad that you found the podcast. And I agree with you. Uh, Bill Anton's one of a kind. I certainly enjoyed that conversation. That episode will be one I go back and listen to time and time again. So thank you for that. And I appreciate you following me on Instagram. If anyone else wants to do that, it's not quite as obvious because you would think it would be Artful Painter, but it's not. You have to find me as artful.creative at artful.creative. There you go. So anyway, I thought about changing it, but you know, at this point, there's so many links and references to it that uh, there would just be a bunch of broken links. I'm just going to leave it like it is. Artful.creative. Besides that, it covers some of my other interests in filmmaking and photography and travel. So anyway, thank you for that, Scott. I appreciate it. So the next comment comes in from YouTube. I'm pleasantly surprised that a number of you listen to this podcast on YouTube. It turns out to be a convenient platform for many. So I appreciate that. So this one comes from J.R. Monks. It's in connection with the uh, Bill Anton episode, uh, Passion for Painting the West. He said, an absolute treasure of an interview. So much great advice. Every painter striving to figure things out and make the most of being a painter should listen to this and take it to heart. Thank you, JR. Really appreciate that. I agree with you. There's a lot of gems in uh, Bill's comments in his conversation in that episode. My next email comes from Nancy Vance. She says, hi, Carl. I've been listening to the podcast and love them. You have a great radio voice and the way you produce each episode is wonderful with the music flowing between the conversations. I have one suggestion. Could you ask the guests to not use hands-free speaker mode? While I understand it's hard to get perfect sound quality on some cell phones, it can get irritating to listen to. Thanks, and keep up the good work. Nancy, thank you so much for your kind words about the podcast and the feedback about audio quality. I did address this matter of audio quality in the last episode that I published of The Artful Painter. I do want to clarify one thing. Uh, I do want to let you know that none of my guests use hands-free speaker mode. They are using a headset that gets the best audio quality possible. Now, it's still not great. And in fact, if you think about this, one of the best audio production values you will ever hear is from NPR radio, right? If you listen to NPR, they have superb audio quality. I wish I could come close to their quality. But oftentimes when they interview a guest, it's over a cell phone. And they have the same issues that I do. But why do they do it? Because that news bite, that sound bite, 
what that person has to say is important. It's so important that they overlook the audio quality of their guest. So I have to do the same thing. I I wished it could be better, but right now this is all we have to work with. I really appreciate your patience when it comes to this matter of audio quality. By the way, Nancy was kind enough to send the link to her website, so I encourage you to check it out. It's nancyvance.com. And by the way, when you send me feedback, and you can do that by going to carlolson.tv and clicking on the contact tab, include your your web link. I I will probably share it, may not always, but but uh, there's a likelihood that I will because <laughs> I enjoy looking at your art. So I don't mind sharing it with my audience. Anyway, I thank you so much for your feedback. It makes my day when I get it. I now want to take a moment to acknowledge the associate producers of The Artful Painter. Associate producers are people who give financial support to my show with their generous donations. Now. The this week I have a new associate producer, Deborah Martin from Minnesota. So that brings the total number of associate producers of the year 2020 of the Artful Painter podcast to 15. I want to acknowledge each one individually: Kelly Bailey, Alan Bloom, Sandra Shook, Jeffrey Eikhoff, Richard Husband, Brent Kimber, Deborah Martin, David McNeil, Jonathan McPhillips. Jim McVicker, Margaret Miller, Debbie Mueller, Frank Wash, Shirley Williams, and Colleen White. Your generosity does make a huge difference. So thank you, all of you. I really appreciate it. If you would like to join the growing ranks of supporters of The Artful Painter, please visit carlolson.tv and click on the Donate tab. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of The Artful Painter. I deeply appreciate you listening. Now it's your turn. Go out there and paint your purple trees. I'll see you all in the next edition of The Artful Painter.